Thanks for staying to the very end to hear me. Um, I'm okay if I talk like about this one way more. So uh, you heard in my introduction, I just I, I, most of you don't know me or haven't met me before, and I just wanted to give you a sense of, of uh, who I am and why I'm interested in, how I ended up interested in robot language. Uh, and as you heard it, I, um, I'm from the South, I'm not Native American at all, and actually never really had any interest, to be honest, in Native American languages um, at first. And like most people who grow up as kind of white people in the South, uh, and then met my wife was Hawaiian, and so learned Hawaiian, and so she got me interested in uh, Native languages and Native culture. And uh, then when I got hired in Colorado, I said, well, who are the people of Colorado? And it's the Arapaho people. So I started uh, working with the Arapaho tribe and doing research. And then once I had worked with Arapaho, I had discovered that robots is very similar to Arapaho. I can almost understand robot, or I can understand it if people talk real, real slow. <laughs> um, so I figured, well, you know, maybe I can help out. Uh, so that's that's kind of the winding road that got me from Memphis, Tennessee to uh, to Harlem, Montana. Um, so what I want to talk about today primarily is um, I'll use one um, linguistic uh, kind of term today, and that's language ideology. So an ideology is an idea people have about their language or about a part of their language, and. Everybody has these ideas. For example, many people in the US look down on Spanish. They think Spanish is a language that's only for immigrants or somehow only for poor people and you're not educated unless you speak English. Uh, that's an ideology, that's not true. There's plenty of really smart people who speak Spanish and in fact are professors. Um, people have ideas about Indian languages, which I'm sure you guys are very aware of. You guys have ideas about your own language. And all the time when we're teaching languages and trying to pass on languages, we're sharing ideas about those languages at the same time. And some of those languages can be, some of those ideas can be subtle and they can actually be harmful. So what I want to talk about today is some of the messages that we send when we talk about native languages and think about those messages and, um, and what we may be saying that we didn't even intend to say. I wanted to just briefly start out by, by giving an example of what I'm talking about. Behind me, you can see a map. So this is a project that I collaborated on. Okay. Yeah, I'll just hold it like this. So this is a project. Um, it's, some, it's from, it's from a, a general website called the Decolonial Atlas. And their project is they take maps from all over the United States and then they work with native languages and native tribes and they redraw the map according to actual geography of native peoples. So what you're looking at right here is southern Montana and northern Wyoming. Um, it's all in Arapaho. So you notice um, in blue are the rivers. So Jaithanitya is the Powder River. Uh, and then the next one up um, is Nithanichia, which is the Tongue River. And then you can see the mountains uh, right there in the middle. Those are the Ho Nini Nahaya, which is the, the rock lands of the Crow people. And then you can see the towns. Um, so along the mountains there, you can see um, Sheridan and Buffalo. And then up in the left corner, it says Tabechana, which is Billings, Montana. Um, and then off on the far right, you can see the Devil's Tower and the Black Hills. But all of this is in Arapaho. So, and, and you notice there's no roads, there's no state boundaries, because Arapaho people, just like Grovan people, Blackfoot people, Navajo people, never had states. Um, those boundaries don't have any meaning um, for the tribes in any way. Um, you cross the Canadian border if you're, you know, being in Blackfoot, that's, that's, that's not part of your culture, right? Um, so the idea here is to, to show um, from a kind of native perspective um, the way the land looked and the way the land still can be thought of by Arapaho people and to erase all of these marks that have been put on the land by, by kind of European style development. 
So that's an example of what's called decolonizing our viewpoint of the, the world and changing our perspective on um, how we might look at the landscape. So in a, in a similar way, let me give you a couple of other examples of, of this kind of thing. Um, Thanksgiving. All of us, white people and, and, and native people as well, we learn about Thanksgiving. And we hear the story about Thanksgiving. And, and everybody can tell this story. The Indians and the pilgrims got together and they, they had a feast and so forth. And if you, but if you listen closely, next time you, you get a chance to hear that story, very often the last words of that story will be, the Indians and the white people were very different, but they got along. So that sounds good, right? They got along. But notice the word I said in there is but. Did you hear that? Just that one little word. They were very different, but they got along. So why did I say but in there? Why, why use that? Because if you think about it, that word in English, it means you wouldn't expect them to get along, but they kind of did somehow, at least for a while. So the fact that I use that one word, B-U-T, says that my attitude in general is that people who are different don't get along. That we should not expect people who are different to get along. Right? So the story seems to be a story about getting along, but behind that, there's an unspoken assumption in the story that generally we don't get along with each other. And especially that white people and native people are not expected to get along. That's the message you send the kids when you tell the story and you put that word in there. So why couldn't, why couldn't the story be they were very different and so they got along? Because if you think about it, native people and white people were very different. They each had things to share with each other. They each had knowledge that the other didn't have. They had the perfect basis for a true relationship. We have things we can share with each other. We can both learn from each other. So why, why wasn't the story they were different and therefore they got along because they could share with each other? But somehow that's not the way the story has been told in American history. It's uh, they were different, but for at least a little while they, they managed to get along and that didn't last. So, so that's an example of, of, a, of an underlying assumption that, that, that goes on that, that we don't even, we're not even aware of. So I'll give a, a simpler one that's probably maybe for, more familiar to you all. Um, if you've ever used or seen a class of total physical response, um, a lot of times you'll see the teacher, um, I'll use Arapaho, but the teacher would say, Janaka, sit down, and then the Aku, stand up, and then Nite uh, Yaku, line up, stand in a line, and then Jack Janaka, sit back down. Right? So probably all of you have seen those kind of classes. And, and then what's really interesting though to me is very often after the class is over, like in a schoolroom, then the teacher will, will say in English, okay class, uh, stand up, go over to the door, and stand in line, and we're going to go out for recess. But they'll say that in English. So what just happened there? So for 20 minutes, the teacher tried to teach Arapaho, and tried to teach the children specifically how to say the aku, stand up, and nite yaku, stand in line. But then, once the class was, was over, once the lesson was over, instead of actually using those Arapaho words, the teacher switched into English to tell them to do something, when in fact, they just spent the whole 20 minutes of the class learning the Arapaho, okay? So I, I see a couple people laughing, it must be familiar. So, so, what, so I wanna argue that this teacher has made a really big error. Um, because what the teacher is doing is the teacher is, is presenting an image to the children. The Arapaho language is something we kind of like pretend to use. Um, we, we do lessons with it, we play around with it, so to speak, but then when we get serious, when I actually want you to do something, then I'm going to use English. So the Arapaho language is not a language that um, has meaning. Um, in order to actually get somebody to accomplish something. Um, so I framed my whole class as 
Arapaho is a, is a fun little subject to learn, but then when we get serious, we're going to switch it to English. So, so that's what happens. So, so that's an example of this term I'm using, which is language ideology. So the kids in this classroom are getting taught by the teachers, um, the Arapaho language exists, but I shouldn't use it if I want to do anything serious. So are they going to learn that language? Why, why would they want to keep studying it? And then the teachers, you know, a year later will say, gee, I've worked so hard all year to teach these kids this language, but they don't seem interested. Well, why would they seem interested when they're being told indirectly every single day it's not anything serious that I can actually use? And every time you want to get serious with me, teacher, you switch to English. Well, why shouldn't I use English too then? So, so that teacher, if she had, he or she had just used nite yaku, stand up, in line, when they were actually getting ready to go out to resource, recess, would have sent a very different message about the language. So I think this is something that we, as like certainly as linguists, um, but also as educators and someone in my own house trying to speak Hawaiian, or someone trying to work um, with Arapo have to constantly be aware of these kind of hidden, hidden messages that we're sending um, to, to young people especially. So I want to give you some more examples um, of, of, of a website that we have developed. Um, and I'm not really interested in talking about websites per se, although I, I could. Um, but, but I want to show you the kind of messages we're trying to send on this website. Oops. Sorry, I think I'll type it too hands. So this is a website um, that, that is hosted by the University of Colorado. And, and I will say just briefly, um, a couple things about the websites because I think it is relevant to this oops, a lot of the discussion that we have we've had today. Um, I was just listening like five minutes ago, in fact, to uh, we, we were talking um, about Blackfoot and the fact that people have multiple writing systems and everybody is kind of doing their own or tending to invent their own writing system and. Um, that, that was an issue with Arapaho as well. And Arapaho, like, like a number of languages, there's multiple reservations or multiple communities. Um, and I, I really feel, and, and I think the people in the tribes as well feel, that it's not really a great idea to have five different writing systems. Um, kids already have enough to worry about. They're learning English, and then they're gonna learn Arapaho as a second language and they're going to learn to write Arapaho, so should we really expect them to have to deal with different spellings of these Arapaho words? Um, so one of, the, one of the things we're doing with this website is we're trying to provide a unified writing system and unified curriculum that can be used throughout the, the area where Arapaho is spoken. So this website is used in Oklahoma, as well as Wyoming, as well as at the University of Colorado, and um, the classes at University of Wyoming use it, um, Central Wyoming College, uh, the Wind River um, Indian High School um, on, the, on the reservation at Wind River uh, also makes use of it. So one advantage of a, as a website is it can provide kind of a central clearinghouse um, for, for information. But um, more importantly, as several people have already noted, for kids to learn a language, um, the language has to remain relevant. It has to be useful to them. And if, if we send a message to kids, whether it's about Hawaiian or Arapaho or Grovant or any other language, that the language is only something that you use if you're an old person, or you only use it for kind of like ceremonies, well, most people don't do ceremonies most of the time. Most of the time they're watching television and goofing around with their friends. Um, so how appealing is that language gonna be? And so the, the effort that, that we're working on in the Arapaho communities and, and on this website is to make the language uh, modern and appealing to young people um, as, while not losing touch with tradition. So I want to show you just a few things that, that 
that we're doing on the website to, um, to do that. So the website has lessons. If you actually want to use it as a classroom tool, it says learning Arapaho, and there's like lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, and you, you learn each, a little bit more in each lesson. There's homework, you can check your answers and all that. But we also have what's called speaking Arapaho. So, and that's, that's directly related to this example I gave about the classroom. You don't want to just talk about learning it, and you don't just want to talk about the language, you actually want to use it. So, um, in our speaking Arapaho section, hmm. waiting for the website. Well, while I'm waiting, I'll show you um, what the content of the website looks like. Hopefully it's going to connect. So on the, on, the, on the left side of the screen, you see a whole list of topics. And you notice the topics we have include NFL team names and NBA team names and football, track and field, fishing, snagging, um, phone calls, child and daycare, at the casino, and so forth. So, um, we've purposely chosen topics that appeal to young people. So, NBA team name, for example. I, I haven't seen any other Native American tribe that has a website. I'll show it to you if this will ever, it's like I'm getting one of those, as you can see, it's not linking or connecting. So, um, but we've actually got all the NBA team names translated into Arapaho. So how do you say Golden State Warriors? Well, that's an easy one, right? Um, but then how do you say Boston Celtics or Los Angeles Lakers? Uh, well, okay, here we go. We connected. So let me, let me show you. Okay. So the Oklahoma City Thunder. Well, that's an easy one. It's the Oklahoma City Baha. It just means thunder. The Portland Trailblazers are the Portland Baanathi, which is the Portland Ica Trail, uh, and so forth. So you might you might be asking, well, this is this is this is a little goofy. Um, wh why would you do this? The point is to prove it can be done. So so, so Richard Little Bear was was talking earlier about how he wanted to show the Cheyenne people that the Cheyenne language still is strong and is still capable of talking about anything in the modern world. And we want to do the same thing with Arapaho. And in particular, we want to prove to kids that the Arapaho language can talk about anything they're interested in whatsoever. And in my experience, the thing that's on television most of the time, at least last month, was NBA basketball. So, um, so that's why we, we put this list up here. And um, I don't think too many kids are learning these names um, very well right now, but what I've discovered is a lot of kids go to this website and say, wow, it's there. And they say, that's really cool. And I have, I have moms who are telling me, oh yeah, my 12-year-old son, um, the, the one thing he noticed on, on this entire website was the NBA basketball names in Arapaho. So, so this is an example where we're trying to lay, build, lay, plant some seeds, as, as we said earlier today, lay the groundwork, um, just as an idea for kids that um, you can use a rapo for anything. And like the, you were saying about Navajo, right? I mean, you can talk about Pepsi, you can talk about Coca-Cola, you don't have to, you know, you can talk about cars, you don't have to switch into English to do that. Um, so our next project, is actually to get video of a basketball game and have someone do the commentary in Arapaho for the game uh, and, and put that on YouTube. Again, just to prove that the language can do these things. So an another uh, thing I wanted to show you is I'll show you um, the, uh, the site about snagging. Okay, and um, so this is under construction. 
and the, the little black arrows have sound, means there's a sound file, so you can click on it and you'll actually hear a native speaker's voice. Um, but again, what do you, one of the messages you want to send to kids is the language can be used in your daily life. It's not just the language you're going to use when you go into the Sundance or even into the Sweat Lodge. Um, it's the language you're going to use when you talk to your best friend about a date. And so, um, is she nice? They are nice. Um, you are nice. She is a real buckskin beauty. Uh, he is real handsome. Uh, you can see uh, they are snagging. I am snagging. Don't go out snagging. Um, he or she snags all around. All these kind of things. And, um, and then at the very bottom, um, her snag is ugly. How oof thawa ne could be ah. Um, is your snag good looking? Kahi thawa ne could be ah. So again, it, it's it's kind of goofy. It's kind of funny, but um, it's what you actually say, right? Um, in English, or um, and it's what those of you who are native speakers would actually say um, in Cree or Navajo or Assiniboine or any of these other languages. So. Um, this is one of the more, we actually have what's called Google Analytics, so you can actually track who comes to the website, um, what pages they visit, and how long they visit the page. And so this is one of our more popular pages um, that, that is used in classrooms and that kids come to, um, and because it, it appeals to their, their, their actual interests, and they can tease each other. And Dick Little Bear, I remember he always said, if you can't have fun with your native language, what good is it? And he said, you, it's got, you've got to be able to laugh with your language. It can't just be all serious or, or lessons. And so what we're trying to do is, is give kids a way to laugh and tease each other. So again, we're sending, we're not just teaching the language, we're sending messages about the language through the way this website is set up and through its content. And I think those are messages that are very important to keep in mind. So, um, there's another message that's being sent on this page, which you might not think about. And that is, language is not just things to memorize. It's not just a list. So one thing I've seen that's a problem in curriculum, um, whether it's on websites or, or anywhere, is you tend to have just a long list. So today we're gonna do animals. And then you have a list of like 15 or 20 animals, and it's just, bear, deer, buffalo, beaver, right down the line. Well, what can you do with that? And how can you change that? Can you do anything creative? So on this website, we actually, we do have a word, right? There's a vocabulary word, be aw, -aw which means sweetheart, snag, um, lots of different possible translations. Um, but then right after that, we have Nebi my snag. Habi your snag. Hibi his or her snag. So the message we're sending here is Arapaho is not just individual words that you memorize, that you can creatively manipulate it, that you can do something with it by adding things at the beginning and at the end. So, um, and right below that, you see a few more phrases. My snag is a real buckskin beauty. So, immediately after the word snag, you have a sentence in which the word's being used. So, we're, we're, we're going from a list to actual expressions. And then, her snag is real handsome. So the next sentence is using the word again, but using his or her as opposed to my. So, so instead of, so we're, we're trying to present the lesson here that the language is something that you can work with to express yourself. And you notice we, we put in dashes, and the dashes actually separate out the different parts of the word. So again, this is, this is underlining to the learner that um, something like, you know, you see at the bottom here, um, that sounds like, oh, that's a really long word. That's going to be tough to memorize that. How many of these do I have to memorize? I'm going to quit right now. Okay, that, that's one potential lesson that, that, that students can take away from seeing things like this. But hopefully, 
um, by, by breaking the words up, you're sending a message to the kids that these words have parts. The language has parts. So it's going to be a lot easier than you think because you just have to memorize the separate little parts. And then you can start putting them together to say all kinds of different things. And um, if you look up at the top of the page, you can see there's like there's five sentences up at the top. And it's that they are snagging, is she or snagging, don't go out snagging, he or she is not snagging. Notice we've got that H-O-O-W in that fourth sentence. So, so right here. Uh, so that's separate. And down here, we have a version of it as well. And down here, we have a version of it again. So, and that's the negative in Arapaho. And, and, and that's not explained on this page, but it's explained on another page. So, so we reuse the same prefix over and over and over on all the different pages of the website. And every time it's used, it's separated off um, with the dash. And so the students can see the part of the word being used like that. And similarly, that means, that means a question in Arapaho. So if I put that at the beginning, it's just like a question mark, basically. So there it is, and a ship. And there it is again with another question. So um, I think it's, it's really dull and boring when students are exposed to nothing but lists to memorize, and they can't do anything with them. So, um, so, so this website is, is trying to do the exact opposite. Um, we're gonna give you just a small set of words, and then we're gonna give you all the ways you can change that word around to do all kinds of interesting and creative and fun stuff. And, and you can do that. So, let me give you another example that's a little bit more traditional of this. Um, So this is um, personal prayer. So this was kind of a touchy topic. Um, I don't document, I'm not supposed to, or I don't document prayers um, in Arapaho. Um, you know, turn off the recorder when, the, when people stand up to pray. Um, and so the, the tribe, the, the, the culture, language and culture commission is not real enthusiastic about us putting prayers on the website. At the same time, among younger speakers, the single biggest request is for how to pray. And in fact, this is the single most popular page of the entire website, based on our measurements. So how do you get around, on the one hand, the tribe doesn't want prayers on the website, on the other hand, everybody wants to know how to pray. Well, one way to get around it would be people learning in the home and working with elders. But again, we have, we have thousands of people living in different states all over the country, um, working across Oklahoma, Wyoming. So what we did was we've put up a template. And what the template consists of is you can see, uh, you normally start a prayer by speaking to the Creator. There are several words for the Creator. So there are your choices. And again, you have sound files, so you can listen to it. Well, then what happens after you do that? Well, you make a request. Well, what are the common things you might want to go request? Well, you might want to say, have mercy on me, have pity on me. Or maybe you want to say, bless me. Or help me. So those are your choices. And then um, we actually explain the first part of these words, jih, you see in every place, is added for emphasis and stresses that the prayer is asking for action directed towards the speaker. And then we separate out the verbs, so we break this down into the two parts. And then we say, oh, but this is all about me. What if you wanted to say us? So, we use the exact same words, but we change the ending so it's have pity on us, bless us, help us. Um, and then we explain the same thing for him or her. And you can see the rest of it. Um, and at the end, we say, to conclude a prayer, people normally say, Nahusaha. You can also say and so forth. So basically, we give people four sentences.
to, to say the prayer. You say, Creator, and you say, this is what I need, uh, and here are, the, here are the basic four verbs that you would need, like bless or help or, or mercy, and then here's how to say me, us, or they, and then here's a few little variations if you want to say bless the language as opposed to bless me, because the language is, is a thing, not a person, and then we get the, the conclusion. So there's not a prayer up there. There, there's, there's no thing that, that you can just read that becomes automatically a prayer. Instead, you can pick from the sentences that you need and you make your own prayer. And, it, and it's flexible. So, it's coming in and out. Uh, so we get away from the restriction on posting prayers. But more importantly, again, we have, we're sending a message here. The thing that I really personally get tired of is when people memorize one prayer. I see this. And then everywhere they go, it's the same prayer. And I mean, I'm not against that. I mean, that's good. That's, that's learning language. So I, I applaud it on that level. But um, you don't say the same prayer at a birthday party and a meal and a funeral right? <laughs> um, or something like that. And in some cases, you'll hear people say a prayer and they'll say, you know, and pity these old people. There's no old people in the room, you know, or, or, or vice versa. Um, so it, it becomes a little bit goofy almost. Um, what this is saying is the language is productive. You, you have to change it and you can change it and you can modify it to suit your needs. And that's a real prayer, a prayer that actually is reflecting the situation. Um, as opposed to just a prayer that someone is just kind of reciting for, from rote. In some cases, I think they don't even quite know what they're saying. They've just memorized the, the lines. Um, and, and you can tell from their pronunciation, they're not quite sure what they're saying. So, so, so there's a message here, and the message is, the language is creative, the language is productive, you can be productive and creative as well, and we're giving you a pattern so you're not going to make mistakes. It, it's, so on the one hand, you have the one problem is memorize single prayer that is not suitable to the occasion. Then you have the opposite problem. Someone says, I have this idea in English of this really fancy prayer I want to say, and now I'm going to try to say it in Arapo or Grovan or whatever. And as, as you native speakers know, when kids try to do that, the results are often disastrous because um, they'll make a lot of mistakes or they'll, they'll, they'll be basically thinking in English, but even though they're talking in Arapaho it's, or, or whatever native language, it's almost like they're still talking English, but with Arapaho words, that kind of thing. So here, um, they have, the Arapaho is correct. It's been checked by native speakers. Um, in most cases, or a lot of cases, they can listen to it to make sure they're pronouncing it correctly. Um, yet, they're not forced to just memorize. They, they have the freedom to, to work with the language and learn. So um, that's, I, I think that's really what should be the goal of any kind of curriculum, um, is to provide that flexibility that, and that ability to use the language, while at the same time giving them a framework so that they're not just completely out on their own, having to invent everything um, from, from scratch, so to speak, and making lots of errors and, and so forth and so on. So, um, Another example of some of the kind of things um, that we've been talking about at the conference is uh, new technology. So um, Dick Little Bear was talking a lot about this. Um, so this is just, just some short examples. Uh, well. Cell phones. So how do you say cell phone? Well, um, got together, came up with a word. And the word is what they accuse the naha, which means just little phone. Um, but again, don't ever just teach a child a word. That, that, that's my belief in, in teaching the language. Because if, if, the, if the child comes to you and says, how do you say cell phone? And you say, what they accuse the naha. Well, the child knows that, but what can they do with it? Almost nothing. So always, always, in response to a question like that, you have to give not only the word, but also some way to use the word. And so we give here four examples of, you know, Chas Sinoa, Nawate Kuth Lanaha, 
I dropped my cell phone. Or, where's your cell phone? Okay, so actual usages. Likewise, email. Um, is, is the word for email, which is electric writing. Um, as you were saying about Blackfoot, same thing with Arapaho. You, there is that noun that exists. You can't say electric writing, but in reality, you almost always use a verb. And so this is a problem I see over and over and over with, with, this, with noun based languages. The kids speak English or, or even like French or Spanish, and those are noun based languages. And so they ask you a noun. You know, that's what they want to know because they think that somehow they can just like go one to one. If I know the English noun and then I get the Arapaho noun, the languages will work the same somehow. And it just doesn't work that way. And, and the next four sentences are all verbs. Chaha kathana is email person, right? So ha chaha kathana hubunethan, I will email you. Ha chaha kathana hubunena, she emailed me. Nik chaha kathana wuna, I emailed him or her. So, um, so there's a message again being sent in the website. And, and, it, and I'm not saying it, right? There's no place on this page that says, English is a noun-based language, Arapaho is a verb-based language. Because I don't think that really means anything to a five-year-old or even a 10-year-old. Um, but what I am, what we are doing is, is essentially saying the same thing. You give them the noun, but then you say, okay, if you actually want to say something, it's all verbs, and here are the verbs. So, um, so these are just examples of the way in which the way you design your curriculum sends subtle messages and can respond to, um, to the kids' expectations or change the kids' expectations um, in really important ways. So um, that's, let's see, I've already been talking for about 30 minutes here. So um, that's basically what I wanted to say, although I guess there's no other speakers. So, um, like John Stiffarm, I can keep going as long as people want, because I'm a professor. If there's anyone more long-winded than teachers, it's professors. But, um, <laughs>